As part of the Magna Carta's Festival 800 celebration, I am here with a very special guest, Eddie B. Allen. So why have you traveled so far? I was invited to be a part of the Magna Carta festivities because I wrote a book, I ghost wrote for Sheila Keys, who was um, one of Rosa Parks, is one of Rosa Parks' nieces. Sheila and her family wanted to share their recollections of who Mrs. Parks was outside of being the heroine that you read about in all the history books and the lady on the bus. They wanted to describe who she was as the person that they grew up with and the person that not many people have heard about. So I was the person that was fortunate to help tell their story. None of them were writers and I'm a writer. And so I was also fortunate to be invited along with them when Rosa Parks was included as one of the figures who would be celebrated in the Magna Carta events. So what inspired you? To start writing originally, um, to become a writer, I think it was just the idea that I was drawn towards storytelling. When I was um, actually much younger even than you are, I think I was maybe six or seven years old, I was always very creative, I was always into self-expression, and I drew. I drew um, just about anything. So drawing was my passion, and then I discovered words one day. I wrote a poem and um, got, to, got to be familiar with how words were actually things that came a little bit more quickly in terms of my mind and my, uh, and, and my thought process. And so by maybe second and third grade, there were programs that were called Young Authors Competitions, and I would write these wonderful stories about myself as a football player one day and as a detective in another story. And um, I, I got recognized. I won a couple of contests. And as I got older, what I did was just explore and research ways that I could actually make money, make a living. And the thing that came to my attention was that I could write as a news reporter. And so that was essentially the inspiration that I wanted to tell stories and got the opportunity to do it as, as a journalist professionally. And eventually, even then, I did not know, but eventually as a person who wrote books as well. So I hear that you did a little bit of reporting for Rosa Parks' funeral. So could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I was writing for, I believe it was a website at the time. It was called Africana.com. It's no longer around. It was bought, and I believe the uh, original Africana.com, it sort of was absorbed into America Online and what is now called AOL Black Voices. They deal with um, historic and social and political news and events that relate to black readership and the audiences that uh, would be would have some some. Uh, curiosity about issues that affect the black community and black leaders. And um, at the time, Africana.com was the closest thing that there was to that. I had a, uh, an assignment <clears throat> as a freelance writer, which basically meant they contacted me for various, uh, various assignments. And it was not that I was full time. They just paired you with what they thought you'd be good at. And because I had some experience with Mrs. Parks, just a little bit when I was younger, they asked me if I would write something about the funeral. It was a very, uh, very grand affair. Uh, if you can imagine a funeral being described that way, I believe it was something like three hours long. Um, it was televised. I remember President Bill Clinton at the time, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Kwame Kilpatrick, who I think was uh, the mayor of Detroit, uh, just as about as many dignitaries, Senator, Barack Obama at the time, who had not become president, uh, just one after another of the, the most um, important dignitaries and influential people in America were just one after another talking about how much they admired Mrs. Park. So one of the more memorable stories that comes to my mind was when Bill Clinton got up and uh, he talked about how when he was a teenager, actually a um, little, maybe a little older than an adolescent, and he and his friends, they were white kids in the South where Mrs. Park's uh, demonstration took place. And he talked about how he and his friends, when they learned that Rosa Parks had refused to ride in the back of the bus, they decided they didn't have to ride in the front of the bus. And so that was their own little protest. Actually, it was a little bit more complicated. Mrs. Parks refused to ride the bus at all after she was arrested. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, very, uh, very, it was like no funeral I've ever seen, put it that way. But I think even with some of what, uh, what might have been considered excessive, 
with the TV coverage and that sort of thing and the fact that it went on and on and on, uh, I think it was in an attempt by those who admired Mrs. Parks to show just how much, how important she was in their minds. It ended with a processional down Woodward Avenue, which is major street in Detroit, and uh, the processional wound up at the at the cemetery. Of course, that's where funeral processions generally go. And there were people who could not attend, could not get in because it was it was such a major affair. You couldn't just walk into the church and have a seat, unfortunately. But uh, those who could not attend the funeral and be in the church, you could see them and hear them on television. And they were lining the streets, yelling things like, "We love you, Rosa," to the hearse as it brought her to the to the place of her burial. And that's one of my more significant memories, even outside of quotes like President Clinton's and the people who were part of the program. So what legacy did Rosa leave behind? I think it was um, a legacy of dignity, of, of being strong and courageous, but in a manner that anyone could emulate. Uh, Mrs. Parks being a, a very demure and dignified southern woman and uh, in, in American culture, that having a certain sort of responsibility in terms of how one presents oneself, um, it's, uh, it's a very sort of challenging uh, line for a woman, I think, and this is probably the case everywhere. Um, women walk a certain line in terms of just their behavior due to double standards of sexism and gender discrimination and what have you, but Mrs. Parks, being a Southern woman, had even more of that in terms of um, her rearing and the reflection that she carried upon her family and all those sorts of things that um, one is already sort of conditioned to consider, but it didn't stop her from doing what she did in a way that affected all of our futures. And Mrs. Parks being as courageous as she was and as dignified at the same time, I think that's her legacy, courage with dignity. Thank you for coming to Lincoln tonight and thank you for letting me talk to you. Thank you for talking to me.